Welcome back to another episode of Pushing Back Cars with me, Paul Mellon McFadden. I hope you guys are out there absolutely crushing it. I hope you've had a, a great week. I hope you've been uh, in action and in communication with your friends and family and your network and that you know, you're pushing yourself towards some goals. There's nothing more motivating than that feeling of moving towards a goal you value. And you know, I just hope all of you guys are really getting traction in an area that's important to you. Like speaking of traction, is the other definition of someone who's stuck in a medical brace and can't move. <laughs> I'm at Mike. How are you going? Uh, oh, things are good. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I almost, cho- <laughs> almost choked on your bad joke there. Um, <laughs> no, the uh, no, it's good, man. Uh, yeah, sitting here doing the show in a uh, one of three braces that I have. It's it's super comfortable. It's um. But- Quick backstory for those who are joining us, either newly or have been away for a while, Mike. Yeah, I uh, got an aggressive uh, match of ping pong and uh, hurt my knee. So if uh, you really want to know, <laughs> go back and listen to the other episodes because I explained it like four times. But uh, yeah. anyway, yeah, just recovering from a little surgery and uh, my legs currently locked in a 96 degree position sitting on this chair with my leg dangling. <clears throat> so I'm not really going anywhere. But I'm here for the long haul, even if Mellon tries to bomb the show again. But uh, <laughs> I'm I'm in for it, man. But other than that, things are pretty good. Um, things have been more positive. I know in the um, our last episode that we released, you know, was it was just real life. It was kind of tough. You know, Mellon Mellon's family took a loss, um, the death of the family, and um, you know, just kind of with me, I. I was uh, getting eaten alive by stuff that everybody does, thoughts, feelings, emotions, you know, just sometimes we get weighed down and bogged down and we get stuck in the mud. But, uh, you know, if there's there's one thing I've ever learned about working through adversity is start singing when you're up to your neck in mud and uh, other people will, will hear it and, and, and come to you and help you and you help them in ways that you never thought possible. So things have been good. Spending a lot of time um, reading, staying mm. busy with any, positive stuff. Any, any particularly good books or passages that are sort of sticking with you at the moment? Uh, well, I'm, I'm still uh, reading through this book by Rick Warren. It's a uh, purpose driven life, man. And, Particularly, it's talking about just kind of, you know, (laughs) what's the whole point? You know, like, what's the big part of life? What's our responsibilities? What do we do every day? How should we act? How do we treat people? How do we treat ourselves? All all these things. And um, yeah, there is some like biblical references in there as well. Um, But the chapters, the last three chapters have mostly just been on uh, prayer and reflection mm-hmm. um having conversations uh not just uh with yourself which are important but also when when you pray how to pray and then also how you talk to other people and and how you should share yourself with other people in your circle your family your friends teammates um being vulnerable letting them really know who you are not putting on this this fake mask uh you know and just being very uh transparent um to the best you can and leaving the fear of getting destroyed uh, because you're being vulnerable. You know, I think we've heard something like this before <laughs> and um, just being able to be real with the people in your life because uh, ultimately God wants you to be real for him, you know? So it's this uh, circle uh, friendship that goes round and round both ways and everybody's active in it. And uh, it's just been really cool, man, because I would say from going from that week, to the last week or two, uh, the feeling is lighter. Uh, I'm, yes, there's there's hopefulness uh, again. There's not anxiousness or fear or worry. Um, it's just kind of like waking up in a state of gratitude where you want to be, and uh, you know, making time every day. Like I said, I go to the park and just read and and sit there, and that's my time to really let in the positives, you know, enjoy small victories and conversations and uh, everything. So it's been good, man. It's been really good. I like that part about going to the park and reading and you just said they're letting in the positives. I think that 
that is just a great little piece for people to think about that sometimes when we're having a hard time, it can be very easy to have a bit of a barrier. Yeah. You know, yeah. that human a human desire to sort of curl up a bit and protect your soft parts, you know, that it comes out psychologically for people sort of shut down and it can just be just make that little effort to open yourself back up to the positives that are going to be around you. Like I, similar to you, maybe Mike, I just, I had quite a few just short and powerful little connections with people here and there, people I, I work with and, and, and mates and loved ones, family and stuff just around uh, hearing that Cherry's father had passed away and just opportunities to connect are, are sort of right there. And it can be, when you're having the hard time, it can be an opportunity for us to practice that. One, you know, one of Mike's favorite comments, uh, you know, practices of being first. You can take that opportunity when you're having a hard time. And then it's pretty funny how many people then just share right back because no one gets through untouched, right? And if you can be first and share some of those hard times with people, just the connection you have with these people, even people you see every day, like there's friends at work, colleagues you know you just immediately have this connection that you've you've shared something with them and they've just told you something right back and letting in the positive i reckon that's a great a great phrase to take with us as we start the episode yeah no it's it's definitely been a helpful thing that's sometimes harder than it should be because we we don't allow it in but uh not the case this week melon but yeah i i really think it is uh, a really good um uh, segue into the topic here so yeah perfect probably about a month ago we put out a post just came across a uh, discussion that's kind of big right now you know just within i mean really anything and relationships friendships and it's attachment styles uh yes. and there was a really good um quiz that i i found and i put out and i've taken twice and uh, I, I shared it out onto the post and there were some people that took it and got some really good feedback and said, would you guys like to do this? So this is listening to the listeners and this episode is for you. And we're going to try to educate ourselves while we go through it and talk about things and, and how they relate to us, what Melon and I uh, maybe got on this re uh, quiz result and uh, really talk about it. And I think it's going to help us maybe understand each other a little bit better, uh, especially within our friendships or relationships. Um, and then maybe it's a starting point to have follow on conversations about uh, maybe how to get to where we all want to be, which is a secure, safe uh, relationship spot. So Can we cover off the sort of the background information here on the attachment theory stuff, Mark? Uh, yeah, you got it, dude. Go ahead. All right, so attachment theory is uh, research from a guy called John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth developed further. Bowlby was in the 50s and Mary Ainsworth was in the 70s. And they were talking about early interactions with children, typically from the primary caregiver, often the mum, uh, can shape a person's attachment style that we carry that with us all the way into our adulthood and that impacts how we relate to people. And they talked about children being children being separated and reunited with their caregiver. And they sort of had their observations. And then in the 80s and 90s, there was a, a bunch more work um, looking at how these attachment uh, theory or attachment styles then impacted adult romantic relationships. And they were like, there could be a connection between the way these little kids acted when their caregiver came back to them and how people uh, connected with their intimate partner when they were older. Um, so there's four theories. There's four uh, ones. And so they're secure, attached. So these are people who feel comfortable and at ease in a relationship, good at communicating their needs and feelings, and they feel open uh, to express vulnerability and so on. You can still have difficulties, but that's your sort of base. You come back to that. And these were the little kids who were happy with strangers and sort of happy when uh, they're on their own and happy when their caregiver came back. And there's three uh, other categories. The first one's anxious, also called anxious preoccupied. And these are people who can get anxious around uh, relationships. They've got a fear of abandonment. They can feel a bit insecure. 
and they want more closeness. And if they feel like the person they love is pulling away, it makes them feel uncomfortable. So it's anxious, preoccupied. And there's fearful avoidant. These are people who feel that relationships are chaotic. That it can be confusing and overwhelming. You go, you're going between anxiety and avoidant. Avoidant being you, you, you don't want the relationship. And it can be that hot, cold. The anxious person wants the connection and can come over as clingy. And the avoidant person wants to sort of cool things down and sort of, you know, hot and cold. So that can be a fearful avoidant. Then there's dismissive avoidant, which is also sometimes, I believe, called uh, disorganized. And these are people who can have like a lot of emotions come up really quickly and at different times feel overwhelmed. They have arguments or situations where they're feeling triggered and they want to pull back. And these are people who want to have independence and can cause difficulty with other people, uh, you know, that that person is pulling away. They see that that person's pulling away from them. But deep down, all three of those uh, different groups, the anxious, preoccupied, fearful, avoidant, and dismissive, avoidant, all want that secure attachment is the theory. Is that a reasonable summary there, Mike? Did I leave anything out or make a mess of any of that? No, it was really, really good uh, overview there, man. Um, <clears throat> you know, looking through these, the first question I think everybody has is like, I wonder where I fall, fall into. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's the first thing. There's a lot of stuff related to childhood development. Um, that's like the key word in all of these things about how your experience was when you were growing up, what your relationship was like, what was with your parents, with your family, what was it like in the home? Um, you know, and I think it would maybe be fair to say uh, that it's not like you were just raised in one place. No, no. I just want to clarify, like, I'm not a psychologist, neither is Mellon, right? And this is like, <laughs> this, this is this is two grown men talking about what we think is here and uh, some of our experiences, and that's about it. Um, there's definitely some more people that we could probably find that, that can speak much more on um, on this topic. But, you know, this is us trying to understand, just like you probably are out there being like, what the hell does this mean? And and how how where do I fit in and everything? So that's that's what we're doing here, just to be clear. But um, I'm sure there's been times where we find ourselves thinking that we are secure and then things happen in our life. And then, you know, whether it's a, you know, a fight or some type of uh, just <laughs> unending or, or upending situation that just throws us into a spiral. And now we're like, oh, well, now we're now we're anxious or now we're fearful and we go through a phase or a season where we are hurt or we are avoiding stuff. Um, I think that's pretty realistic to say. I mean, no, you know, 100%. it's not, you know, it's not it's not like, well, I'm secure, so I'm always going to be secure. Like that doesn't make sense that you know, life happens, pain happens, we experience things, we we lose people. Um, and yeah, we're emotional creatures. So like when anything really terrible happens. Uh, as we said, nobody gets a pass and you're, you're going to hurt. You're going to feel things. You're going to not trust people because somebody at some time in your life just brutally broke your trust and, and, and hurt you for one reason or another. And, and also Mark, like you can have a relationship between two secure people and still have your normal problems of being a human come up and tough situations and financial pressures and all those other things happen to everyone. This is just how people are going to fall back in the norm when things are good, what their typical way of feeling in a relationship is like, you know, but life happens to everyone. So it's not like, you know, the secure attached people to label them, get a pass from any of that stuff either. It's just, and, and, you know, you get a curveball thrown at you and, you know, someone can, a secure person could break your heart or cheat on you. All those things can still happen. You know, like life still occurs and people still have your underlying principles and ethics and values and all the other stuff that we talk about on the, on the show all the time. I'm still uh, in play here. Yeah. 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 It's, um, you know, one thing, one thing I, I did when I was prepping for this episode is I went through each and I asked myself, I was like, man, was I always, was I always in the secure uh, category? And yeah, I, I, I was. And and to be honest, you know, I've shared about it on here. I, again, the last three to four years, 
I went through three different attachments uh, after reading through this and learning more about it, uh, understanding myself. You know, I'm not I'm not talking about anybody else on here. I'm, I'm understanding myself and what I felt and kind of how I was. And um, as uh, you know, as I look at it, uh, you know, 2020 was a, a terrible time for me. Um, you know, and it was. I lost complete trust in a person um, because they, they hurt me so bad. Right. And I remember going, well, let me give a little context. So I, I wanted a relationship with somebody. It it got really weird. There was a lot of quiet and, and non-communication with a lot of stuff. Turned out they were already with somebody else for like a long time and it didn't work out. Right. I was crushed. I, I, you know, I went from a very high confident guy, you know, with my job, my career, everything I've accomplished, I was very high, like living in the, 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 on the ceiling. And then I went completely down to the rocks because I knew, I knew nothing about this person. I, I didn't see it coming. Uh, it was just a, you know, a steel bat to the back of the head. And it was just, oh my God, like everything came down and crumbled, uh, which led to like depression and all these other stuff. So I went from a very secure person and feeling confident to straight down to the rocks where I would say it was definitely um, the avoidant uh, attachment for me. So wow. I was really cut off from my emotions and I, I, I didn't want any intimacy whatsoever. I remember going to my own job and looking around and look, I'm, I'm a very straight guy. <laughs> Raph, Raph would fight me on this, but um, <laughs> I remember going to work and sitting at work with my own teammates and wondering if one of them was the one that she was seeing. Like I didn't trust anybody around me. And I remember sitting there going, oh, my God, I am this bad. Like, I am that insecure that I have zero trust in any person around me, probably except like my absolute best friends and, and like my, my mom or something. I didn't trust anybody. And that was rightfully so. I mean, I was, you know, it, it's dealing with like a wound, right? You're, you're wounded, you're protecting yourself, you're putting that that wall up so nothing can come in and, and irritate it or give you hope and then crush you like nothing. Um, so I was definitely the avoidant uh, at that point. I, I wanted my walls up. I didn't want any relationship. I was like, oh, my God, like, where am I going? How am I going to heal? Um, and that was, you know, reading about this, it absolutely makes sense where I was. And then I also look at... Um, how I was with other people for a while after that, a few months after that. Yeah. There, you know, there, there's, there's a need for communication. There's a need for friendships, relationships, you know, and being social with other people. I cut myself off. Uh, hence Wrong. kind of the depression piece was really tough for me. Um, but I was avoiding any possibility of getting better because I was so scared that I was going to get hurt, uh, even again, or even worse. Mm. Um, so anyway, just to start it out, I know I was in the avoidance stage, uh, of being there and I don't think it was anything because of my childhood per se, but I definitely felt a connection to that when my dad died. And I felt like I lost that connection with my dad and that side of my, uh, my manhood and masculinity was uh, not fulfilled to say the least. And I started thinking about that more and how that affected me as a young man of when I got older, that it was like, I remember saying like, God, how, how, how could you do this to me? Like, I thought you mm -hmm. loved me you know, and then my dad was taken away. And I also kind of felt those same things when that happened in 2020 was like, man, how could you do this to me? And it was kind of a repeat. And there was a lot of similar feelings and loss and pain um, there. 
And I, I think they're definitely related in a deeper sense that maybe I, I still don't fully understand, but I want to acknowledge it. Mm. It plays out in all sorts of ways, right? Losing, losing parents. I mean, I, look, I think everyone has some sort of trauma in their lives. The scale of it is obviously different for all of us and the age that it occurs at is different for all of us. But, you know, I don't think you ever get past or get over losing, you know, your dad. I don't think there's, I don't think you're ever going to get get over that that loss and that example of, you know, what is it to be a man? It's such a big, and, you know, for for women, their dad, or for women, their mum, or for men, their mum as well, of that role model, that it, first ever role model you're going to have, you know, what is a man? What is a woman? What is a, what is a good person? And when you don't have someone that you did have that's going to play out and especially when you're having um you know loss or, or heartbreak in a romantic relationship i can really understand that mike that that desire to protect yourself or that fear of um having the other person break up or is this going to happen is this going to happen repeatedly like that i can see how that can really impact you and that you can show up in different ways despite having a, what a psychologist would say, is a, a, a nice, stable childhood and a great connection with your caregivers that would typically mean you're secure, that life happens and it, it can be impacted in that way. Yeah, and I actually, my my other best friend, John, we, we had a discussion when I was home over Thanksgiving and uh, – it's just something that we, I, I appreciate about him and he appreciates about me is, you know, we can talk about stuff. And uh, he, he looked at me the one day and he, he just said, man, you made no excuses. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you had so many excuses to just be like, you know, really like a piece of shit and, and be this toxic person or point the finger at everything, why you weren't successful. And, and, and you, you chose to go the other way um not not putting him down or himself down but you know he's like dude i had i had such a better um family life than than than, than you and he wasn't bragging by any means you know he's we're just we're just talking but he had a secure family he had the, both of his parents you know they were always there uh you know he went to college they had more financial um stability and everything my parents were separated my dad died you know we filed bankruptcy like a whole bunch of stuff kind of happened, you know, and it was a whirlwind for me. Um, but it was just showing just like, you know, even though these hard times and you may get into one of these, uh, you know, <laughs> these feelings of attachment that are, are, aren't secure and they're kind of negative, there, there is a way out of them. It's uh, a lot of predetermined choices that you stick to. Uh, and then also mm. um, making decisions along the way that you have to stop and pause and like think about and be like, man, this is who I am in this moment. This is who I want to be in this moment. And then you have to ask yourself, like, are they matching up? Uh, is this who I want to be for myself, for this person, for this relationship, for my family, uh, whatever it is. And then kind of, kind of make your way through. You're probably not going to do it perfectly. Um, cause I know I didn't, <laughs> but, uh, I never lost sight of the, the goal at the end is, Hey man, I want to be secure with myself. I want to really know who I am. Yes. I really want to know who I am to other people. I really want to know who I am, um, to my family, you, you know, and, uh, makes you, makes mm -hmm. you stop and evaluate. There's yeah, there's a lot in that. It was interesting reading up on, uh, some of the research that's sort of underpins this stuff. It's not just, it's not just a, a guy in a bar with a beer in his hand who's got an opinion. There's quite a lot of uh, research that has gone into the development of these these theories and are applied in different areas. And it's really interesting because when my daughter Annie was born, uh, super prem back in the day, in the neonatal unit, they had a a practice of ensuring and tracking when the little prem babies, when they got to being big enough that they could come out of their cribs for very limited times initially and it's like a whole medical procedure getting them out they do these things called kangaroo care and it's they get skin to skin so the little baby 
will be put typically on the mother's chest. I got I got one or two as well. It's an unbelievable experience when you have the chance to hold your baby for the first time. But I didn't know that this practice that Cherry and I both had gone through back in the day when Annie was little was driven by this uh, attachment theory. So kangaroo care for PREMS is, a t- is associated with an increased survival <laughs> statistic. It actually helps the babies survive and thrive. And they, there's not like... They haven't figured out what the biological thing is, but it's the baby feeling the skin to skin contact has all this data around it's better for them. And, you know, this is something that I was doing nearly 17 years ago. And it, just reading up on this, it's like it fits exactly into the theory. You know, these little babies feel that comfort and connection. And it's it's used a lot around the world it's used in all the Western world, but it's also used in uh, the poorer parts of the world as like a a cheap sort of a boost that they can do. It doesn't take a lot of equipment. You just got to obviously be be clean and careful with all that kind of stuff. And then getting the getting the baby skin to skin time with their primary caregivers in the beginning really causes these little ones to thrive. And there were some of the babies in uh, Western Australia and Perth where we were living at the time where it's just, it's a gigantic state, Western Australia. There's like two and a half million people and it's probably about a third of the continental US. So it's about the Western third of Australia. It's a huge area. Mm -hmm. And so they're very, very remote. There are really remote sort of settlements all the way, you know, thousands of miles away. And they get flown into Perth. That's like the main center. It's where they've got all the equipment and the expertise. And so, but in a lot of instances, there can be people who are not able to have mum or dad in the city with the with the baby like they might have other family kids and so on the farms or whatever they've got, they've got to run and so the the doctors and the nurses track this um skin to skin contact time on the charts just like where they're tracking the the feeding and the weighing and the medicines and all the rest of it and they don't let the babies go without having skin to skin time and they i used to sometimes see the director of the neonatal unit this amazing dr ronnie hagan God bless him if he's uh, listening. And doctor from Northern Ireland who ran the unit there. And I remember coming in at 2 a.m. just because I just couldn't sleep and had to come back to the unit and check on Annie. Came in and it's all dark. And there's this middle-aged doctor who's the director of the neonatal unit sitting there in the dark and he's wearing a sterile smock and he's cleaning his chest and he's going around changing smocks and cleaning himself and giving these babies cuddles at, at night the ones who'd had the longest time between family visits or the longest time since their previous cuddle. And it's just, it was an amazing thing to witness just the act of love that was underpinning this man. And he was then, he was there all day. It's not like he was, he was, uh, but he also just loved these little babies so much. And it was an example of how this theory has led to a medical practice. It's, super non-impactful there's really no negatives uh as long as they're cared for monitored while they do it to make sure that they don't have issues with their breathing and so on but it's just a it was a beautiful thing to experience at the time and then reading up on this theory in preparation for the podcast to be like man i can't believe that this is something i got to see at that time and it had such a it was just such a, a beautiful thing to witness and to to do it with myself with Annie when she was a baby, just a blessing. So I just wanted to share that that was something that I'd read up on and I'd seen previously, you know, 16 years ago, Mike. Yeah, no, that's, that's a beautiful example. I mean, literally from the beginning of your life, I mean, you're being brought into the world, how you're supposed to be, you know, I, I like that. What was it called? Kangaroo or what was it? Yeah. Kangaroo care. Kangaroo care. So it's, it's imitating the, um, the kangaroo we all know is a big Australian marsupial that has a pouch and the little baby kangaroo is in the pouch. Yeah, It helps regulate the, the baby, the, the neonatal baby gets its body temperature regulated by the mum or dad or that they're having the cuddle with. And um, yeah, just imitating that. It's the, it's the same terms used in the US, kangaroo care. That's cool, man. Um, you, confidence, you, security and emotional well-being and all these other things that are happening at the same time do you think not as a baby but us as adults that that still works 
Oh, I'm a hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. I just, anyone who doesn't think that just picture getting a hug from your mum or, you, <laughs> or a grandparent, you just, that, that, you know, there's no, there's no substitution for a cuddle like that. I think that all humans, we've got that need for touch. You see monkeys, chimpanzees spending all day grooming each other and touching and like we've evolved out of that, that, that's one of humans. It's got to be one of our main needs, you know, without that, I don't think anyone was going to thrive. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's true. I, I asked that because, uh, you know, I kind of felt that when I went home over Thanksgiving and I rented a, I rented a let cabin for everyone day. Know. Yeah. 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 yeah let know. <laughs> Talking about attachment theory, attachment. Mike's got the best relationship. He's got the best relationship with his mom. It's so sweet. Why don't you let everyone know what you do on Thanksgiving, man? Well, I so every time I go home, right, and, and here's maybe this part of attachment, right? But every time I go home, I feel like a pinball. So I'm always jumping around because, um, you know, family is kind of spread out and best friends are spread out. And every time I go home, I never feel like I'm home. So this year I was like, man, I want to create a home. Like I want to create a space where we could just – be comfortable, relax, all these things. So I rented a cabin up in the mountains of Pennsylvania for three days. And I picked up my mom and just took my mom. Well, when I, I picked her up and showed up there, she gave me like the biggest hug, right? Because she hasn't seen me since I've really been injured and everything else. And I started walking last week on my own without crutches, right? So it was like euphoric and she could see how happy and excited I was when I got out of my truck and I was walking towards her. She was like, oh, you know, I'm her baby. I'm still and always will be her baby, right? And gives me the biggest hug. And it just felt so nice uh, to, to, to get that. So Melon's absolutely true. Like, man, you just get a hug. So, but just spending that that three days with her and quality time and no distractions and cooking Thanksgiving dinner together, listening to music. I built a fire outside and we just sat there and talked for the night. Um, you know, it was just a beautiful mountain fire night with billions of stars and the moon was out and, um, the fire going and we played some music and, um, just reminiscing about good and great times and just really brought me closer to my mom, you know, which I, I, I wanted in, uh, for a while, you know, just as we get older, we're so busy, you know, everything else, but um, it, it was really nice, man. But exactly what you said is just having that, having that connection with somebody, especially someone really close to you that you can hug them. They can tell you, you know, Hey, I love you. Well, I love you too. And um knowing that they're there for you. Uh, and I, I think the word is unconditional for unconditional love, you know, like mothers will always love their kids unconditionally. So will fathers. Um, it's just one of those things, but, uh, that brings such a secure feeling attachment to those people. And that's what we all want. Right. I mean, how nice is that story? I get it. Was it yeah. always like that? No, it wasn't, but I always wanted it. Yeah. So I had to create it, you know, like it, it, it takes effort to get to a secure place uh, out of dis being disorganized or anxious or fearful or whatever it is. It takes effort to get where you want to go. And it, it doesn't just happen, you know, that that's, it's such a nice story. I mean, I was, I was so blessed. Mike gave me a call. Ch Chesa and I got to have a, a video call and see Mike's mom. No, they're cooking together. They both were in there. PJs or jammies or jammies. I'm not sure how you guys call them. And they were just, <laughs> it was clear. They just had, there was no, there was no agenda. There's no agenda for the day. They had no one to see. They had no time to put the food on the table. And they were just cooking breakfast together and having a cup of coffee. And oh, it was just such a beautiful moment to share. And that, that idea of how good it is now. And, and you touch on such a beautiful point then, Mike, that we all want, to have that secure connection we want to have that consistent love and and so on but we don't always have it and maybe we didn't we maybe we weren't given it you know the circumstances of our parents maybe they were they didn't have the resources or the time or they were struggling with life um but it sounds like from what i've read and what you've just shared there mike that there's ability for people to to shift and grow and change you know so it's not like 
you know, there might be a natural one you fall more easily into. But from what I've been reading, it sounds like there's plenty of opportunity or things that people can do to shift their attachment style view. Um, Are you able to share about any things that you may have done or that you've read about, Mike, on how people can look to try and move towards that secure attachment if perhaps their childhood didn't offer that naturally? Yeah, um, you know, all... All I've really learned is that I can only change and control myself. So I can put in the effort into myself. I can put the effort into the situation. I can maybe help set the environment, but Mm. I just want to lead with saying I can't change other people. Um, Yes. I've, I've tried. Okay. And I talked about this before. I'm a fixer. Uh, Melon has called me out on this many times being like, Mike, you're a fixer, man. You, you wear your heart on your sleeve kind of thing. You don't like to see people struggle or in pain and you jump to them and you want to help them. Um, and I, I, did, I only called you out because I can recognize it. Cause I do. I am that as well, Mike. It's there not a criticism. Go. There you go. Right. And, and that's, that's man. That's why I, ha- I love having Melon in my life is because he's very honest like that. Um, so when he made that comment, you know, I really started looking at myself and be like, man, what, what am I doing? What am I contributing to? How do I say things? How do I present things? How do I communicate things? Um, mm. And I start, I stopped looking outward and I started looking inward more being like, who am I and what the hell am I doing? Right. And I started reading about these and there was a test that I found. Uh, it was by the, uh, was it the personal development school, which we're going to post. I think I put it out on a story on our Instagram page and some people might've took it, um, which is very interesting, which will put you into one of, one of these uh, four categories, like what's your attachment style. So I took that uh, twice over the last year and mine came back as secure attachment, which I was pretty happy about, man. Like that's the thing though, is yeah. you got to answer it very, very honestly. Like you can pick the best answer that you think, but you have to pick you. So it has nothing to do with anybody else outside of perception, but you have to be very honest with yourself and be like, is this how I want to respond? And I've taken it twice and I've got secure attachment. And I was like, okay, well, that's really good. But what are some of these other feelings that I felt before that may have drove me into uh, like I said, being anxious or the avoidant attachment. Um, I don't think I was really disorganized at, at, at times. I think it was maybe avoidant because I was hurt so bad. And of course, whenever you're, you touch a hot stove and you get burned, you don't want to touch it again, right? Because you know, you're going to get burned um, or anxious attachment. That's just fear. You know, it's just like, well, you're sitting around uh, dependent on somebody But then it's just like you tend to worry about them in a relationship of like being abandoned or you're not getting a lot of reassurance or something. And you constantly, constantly, constantly need that of like, you're not going to you're not going to hurt me. Right. You're not going to leave me. Right. You're not going to do this. Right. You're not going to do this. Right. And it's every single day to the point where to your partner, it's like. Bringing them down because you're questioning them being a good person, you know, and it's just like, man, you can't do that. Like, that's not fair to your partner. So looking at all these things internally, man, is, is is really understanding myself, understanding what I've been through and acknowledging, yes, I've been hurt before. Yes, I've been through pain. Yes, I had this childhood trauma. Yes, I had this. And then it has brought me to this point. This is where I fall in the, that spectrum of attachment. Okay, well, that's reality. That's where I'm at, yes. how I feel. Where do I want to get to and then start reading about how to heal those um, insecure attachments, right? How are you going to trust again? You know, like that's a big one for everybody. You know, dude, the the dating pool and the relationship thing is trash right now. Like you, you can't trust anybody as far as you can throw them. Like it's, it's insane. Just, you know, are you talking to ton of other people? You know, are you on these dating apps? Are you on this? You know, just going on that, man. That's like a big thing for me. I got rid of it. Uh, I got rid of the dating apps. I got rid of all that crap. That was just an extra layer of, uh, you know, 
worry and stuff. It's just like, man, I want to meet somebody naturally. Those apps are designed to yes. uh, keep you to come back. It's 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 kind of funny uh, when you think about it. They're designed to find yeah. you a partner, but they're also designed to make you come back to get your dopamine hit and interaction. I and- want, I want, they don't want the users to stop using the app, right? Like they've got their own self interest. <laughs> like I think we should, I think we should talk about that just in a minute. But I, I'd love to just finish this little bit on your journey or, or what you've read and ways that people can that you've seen work for people to be able to transition towards that. And you were t- talking initially, there was a really good bit there about self-awareness and that you were going to share the test that you took and you were, which you got to be really honest with, right? You can't be like, well, I wish I was like this and I'll answer this way. Right. You got to be like, no, this is really how I am. And be being kind to yourself, like there's no right answer. There's just what what's true, like trying to be authentic in this, like we try in all areas in life. I think that's always the best path. And, how have you seen that play out? You know, that self-awareness, authenticity, information and reading. And how have you been able to apply that? Or have you read that that's been applied? Yeah. And I, I know I kind of went on a tangent there, but, you know, the whole thing was I stopped focusing on the outside stuff I couldn't control and started really focusing on just what I could control. So, like I said, I can't control other people or what they're doing or what they're doing in their free time or anything. All I could focus on is like, I want to be secure with myself. I want to be able to look in the mirror and be like, hey, you're confident. You're doing the right things. You're following your heart. You're not out there doing tox- toxic stuff to people. You're not an alcoholic. You're not doing drugs. You know, like you're, you're not out running through people. You're not using people. You're not abusing people. You're not, you know, lying to people all the time. You know, it's just like, get right with yourself first before you're even worrying about, well, I need to fix this friendship. I need to fix this relationship. You need to fix yourself first and, and know where you fall. Otherwise, you know, it's like trying to force two uh, North magnets together when you don't understand magnetism. You know what I mean? It's like, you're never going to get close if you're sitting there trying to force these two magnets that don't, they're just not going to work. Right. You have to understand, are you north or south? And then try to surround yourself with people that are going to attach to you for a healthy reason. Right. So oh, good, man. I know that was pretty good. I just came up with that, dude. That's yeah, not yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> the stuff that this gels in so well with the, um, the stuff that I've been reading is that that step one is self-awareness. So, you know, hopefully this link with the, the test is good for people. And just an awareness that there is something called attachment theory that has good uh, scientific underpinnings and works for people seeking out information you can therapist books there's lots of places you can go for that mindfulness and emotional regulation now this i think is what mike's talking about there about looking at that internal versus external locus of control like i can only control me i don't have to control anyone else focusing on personal growth was a step four so what can i do now how can i how can i soothe myself how can i get comfortable sitting here on my own i don't have to keep picking up my phone to text that person or whatever that thing is that you're trying to uh behavior you're trying to move away from and step five being patient with yourself and the other person because we're all human and then there's that persistence just like this is not going to be something that's going to change quickly if you've had you know traumatic childhood or these impacts from childhood they they sort of leave their fingerprints a long time so don't give up on yourself if or the other person if there's if this if this stuff takes a long time to change you know it took a lifetime to become this way it might take an extended period not going to change overnight into something different would you agree that that's a reasonable summary there mike no a little bit of steve covey's circle of influence circle of concern there you know recognizing what you can control and the stuff that is beyond your control. Yeah. And and it's easier said than done. I I am admitting I was just struggling with that. Okay. Um, so we're all going to go through it like at some point and it's okay. Um, the only thing that I would, um, yeah, we're coming to the end here and I, I got to get to uh, physical therapy soon, but um, the whole point is understand where you're getting the steps to progress from okay um 
I tried to look at this topic and then was looking around again, you go on Instagram, you go on Facebook, whatever, mostly Instagram and these algorithms that are out there. I mean, who are you getting your advice from? Who are you, who are you getting your, your pathway? Because there's a lot of people out there who are stuck in unhealthy attachment parts. So if you're a secure person and you're trying to figure out how to fix a friendship or a relationship, and there is a person who is a straight up disorganized or avoidant attachment uh, person that's stuck in that pain part of their life, they're going to make some type of emotional post being like, oh, this is what you do to get this person back or to hurt this person or show your worth. And it's like, no, that is not what you're supposed to be doing. Right. And it's easy to fall into it because sometimes our brain tries to make sense of attachments or trauma yeah. or different things. Yeah. And your brain is literally programmed to connect A to F e, when there's no B, C, D, or E. It, like, it, it, will, it will try to make sense to calm itself uh, when you look at it from a psychological point of view, right? So go to a professional, seek out a professional psychologist, one that you like, they're, they're all different. Uh, we learned that from Dr. Aaron when we had her on is like, you don't have to go to one and, and accept it because everybody's different and perceive things, which is fine. Um, but also, um, you know, re read well renowned books on relationships. Um, there's stuff on the relationships in the Bible uh, and how you are sp supposed to treat one another. Right. Um, there's so many good resource resources out there. All I'm basically saying is don't take a, flipping through Instagram picture or a post as, ah, there's the key to the rest of my life and how to be happy and successful and have a successful marriage or a relationship or a friendship. Cause it's probably an emotional response that somebody did because that's just the way social media is. Right. So that's the only advice that I would give uh, for the closing part. I got caught up in it. You know, if you search for the answer, ah, oh, that sounds good. That makes me feel better, but then wait, but then what's this, but then what about that? And this doesn't still make sense. Fuck that. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, there's no other way to put it, man, because it's it's caused me so much sleepless nights that it's like it's not worth it because you need to just focus on yourself and rebuild yourself like nothing else. And your world will just start getting better. I mean, listen to me from a week or two ago to how I'm talking now. I put it into practice and you're working at it and stay consistent and make time for it every day and things will get better. Work on yourself, stay consistent, give it time. There's some good stuff there. Now, just quickly before we close, I thought we could just return there to social media. So like I also did a little bit of prep and read some of the attachment theory stuff around social media because it just seems like a landmine, <laughs> that landmine filled field. Jerry and I sometimes are like, man, we're so grateful that we met <laughs> back in the day before this you know this modern era so there's there's positive and negatives though there are there are some positives like uh even just mike and my relationship we ma we maintain this on a digital media like there's increased accessibility and connectivity that we have now that was not there in the, in the past there's some positives facilitating communication here's mike and i other side of the world different time zones so this can be the same for for everyone out there avoid it people can have uh where they get they can get over, overloaded they get to control the other person's access or time with them or how close they let, let the other people you know the other people want to be to them and you can find communities online so they're like four positives increases accessibility connection facilitating comms controlled interaction for avoidance and building a community the negatives are pretty obvious superficial judgment selective self-presentation FOMO there might be someone else out there these apps are designed to keep you going they don't want they don't want their user base to reduce so you know I read or hear about people out on dates and hearing their other person's phone beep with a tinder match I'm so so grateful sometimes I preceded all this stuff <laughs> and hookup culture digital infidelity comparisons and insecurity there's a lot of stuff that is negative in it so 
it's a it's a landmine uh, filled field with this modern social media and uh, online culture that we're in but you can manage it there's there's pros and cons but you've got it, all the stuff that mike's been talking about there you know like figuring out yourself and focusing on yourself and not chasing after the wrong kind of people that all holds true do you think that that's a fair sort of cover coverage of um, social media and online how that plays out with attachment theory mike yeah, I think that's probably the biggest point is just because it's that's our world now. Everybody's attached at social media level and you know, you, you there you can't help but just sit there and think of like, you know, who are you, who else are you talking to? You know what I mean? Like there there's conversations mm-hmm. like that every single day that I hear about and it's just like, dude, just just fall out of it. Like just yeah. Don't don't even It doesn't matter. It. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you're talking to, right? Right. Like if you if you're great and they're great and you build, are able to build something together, then wonderful. You know, like this is just the era we're in, I think. And if you're in that whole comparison and FOMO sort of mindset, you're going to you're gonna come across, even if you're, you, you could be the most secure person in the world, but you might come across as that anxious uh, connection style, you know, where you're needy and clingy and stuff. So it's, I think people are going to have to, you know, the uh, they say the difference between med- in medicine and, and, and poison is the dose, right? Like, be careful how much of this you are bringing in your life. And you heard Mike there just at the start say uh, he's he's controlling that access. And I think that's a really key part to maintain that self-esteem and confidence and so on, which is so important. Yeah. And, and I guess my last point is be careful with, you know, like you said, the dose, how much you're taking, but also maybe how much you're giving um giving giving your 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 time your energy your concern um emotion to people who don't want it or who don't deserve it um you know sitting there as a secure person and you're trying to give your time your love your energy everything into a person that's avoidant mm. could literally be like you're beating your head off a wall going what the hell else do I have to do to get through to you that I like, I just, I just want you, or I I want this to work. I want this to be a good relationship. Um, and here's all the things that I'm doing. And I, I'm saying this from experience, from a, a relationship I had, um, there wasn't a damn thing that I, I, I couldn't do that wasn't like good enough or that didn't come with automatic suspicion. And it was driving me crazy. Like I would talk yeah. with Mellon about this a lot, um, outside perspectives, uh, professional per- perspective, um, talk again, I went to the professionals to address myself, not so much the other person, but I'm like, am I doing something wrong? What is my problem? What am I saying? What did I, did I did this situation this way. Right. And I think what it was really is like, I think it was an anxious attachment that I was fighting and there was a barrier. There was a wall up there because they were hurt from something else that uh, I don't believe was part of me uh, that I, that I caused. I think it was just, uh, you know, little things came up that irritated them, which put them into a spiral uh, and put those walls up. And then it was automatically defensive mode. Um, and it, and it hurts, right? Because all you want to do is just like care and love for this person and, and hug them and just tell them it's going to be okay. And it's just like, we're okay. Like, you know, I don't want to go anywhere. And the thing that you get is the stiff arm to the face and it's, um, you know, accusations. It's, um, I know, I know this is happening. Just, just tell me. And they're trying to find something wrong when there is nothing wrong, but they're trying to find that aha moment so they can feel that relief to what their body and their minds telling them through that anxiety to give it purpose, right? Well, I'm not feeling this anxiety for any other reason. So I know there has to be something wrong right there and you're going to, and I'm going to find it. But what you're doing is you're killing the present. You're killing the joy. You're killing the happiness that has taken place. The good stuff, you know, like I said at the beginning, find and let the good things in, right? And when you're so worried about stuff, anxiety and fear and all these other past traumas or whatever it is, 
you're killing the present and then you're you're going to kill that friendship you're going to kill that relationship because it's what happened to me i sat there and i was like man there's nothing i can do to make you happy there's nothing i can do to fix this and i tried and i tried and i tried and i i got to the point where um i didn't feel appreciated i didn't feel trusted i didn't feel um like anything i did what wasn't enough and and i believe i truly did a lot for this person, but it wasn't enough. And I had to choose to walk away because Mellon saw it for a while. Um, I was, I was becoming who I didn't want to become. I was frustrated, angry, um, beating my head off the wall, like, you know, crying sometimes. And I'm just like, I, Mellon, I don't understand. Um, and that's why reading all these attachment styles and understanding myself first, and then knowing what's out there and what other people are possibly dealing with and acknowledging them, not just being like, oh, you're crazy. Get the fuck away from me. Um, that's simple bullshit. Um, I really wanted to understand. And the more I, I read about these things, the more I understand the people in my life and what what's happening or what has happened. And I'm like, OK, I can't hold that against them. Like we're all human. Right. And then just the kind of guy I am, I guess. I've learned through church and reading to forgive and have grace for people that, Hey man, look, we're not all perfect. We've all hurt. I've been hurt. I've, you know, I was the avoidant stage and at times it's just a season. It's just a stage and man, it's just let it go, you know, focus on you, what you can do, what you can control, be good to people. I know I'm good to people, have a good heart and do your best. And whatever happens, happens. It's such a hard thing to say because I hate that. Like it is what it is and all that. Like that used to irritate the shit out of me because it just sounded like I don't care and it's just a throwaway line. But there there is some um deeper stuff to it when you really put it into that perspective. So well, that's a great summary, guys. We're gonna post links for the attachment theory information. And and Mike had a great site that had a little a test you can do, and we encourage you to to read up on this stuff. There's some great research that underpins it and they seem to be developing it all the time. Like there's a lot more stuff now than there was uh, back in the day. And they're applying it from the neonatal unit through to couples therapy and all sorts of stuff. So hopefully we've just, again, Mike and I are not psychologists and we don't play them on the internet. We both have normal day jobs, but there's a lot of uh, benefit from having some self-understanding and we hope that you guys are able to apply some of this in your own lives one last thing I just want to leave you with is just consider the impact of this theory on any of you out there who are parents. So I just encourage where you can to do a bit of reading on that yourself and think, who am I being and how am I impacting the next generation and can I adjust my style? Are there things I can do to try and foster that safe environment, loving environment so that the little ones under your care, uh, growing up in a, a stable, uh, secure attachment environment. All right, big episode. Uh, once again, as ever, please, if you're getting benefit out of these, subscribe, uh, share the podcast, leave us reviews. We've got a great little uh, contest or raffle, I guess, underway at the moment with some Christmas giveaways. There's plenty of stuff on on. Uh, the Insta and Facebook sites there about how you can enter. And we, you know, it's that time of year. We we lit the Christmas tree on the compound last weekend and Annie just <laughs> absolutely manifests the spirit of Christmas. So it's about, it's coming into the start of December and it's a season for giving and connecting. And we hope that there's a benefit you're able to uh, get out in your networks. So from Mike and I, until next week, take care and look after yourself and your friends.